Hello. On behalf of my co-authors, Jeff Doctor, Pia Tambolero and Elizabeth Austin, I'd like to tell you about some work that we're doing in the emergency department, looking at the journey of the mental health patient. Um, mental health patients in emergency departments um, don't often have a very good journey. Uh, the normal processes that we have in emergency departments aren't very well matched to the needs of the mental health patient. In Australia, and it might be different in different countries, but in Australia, a patient that's having an acute mental health illness enters the emergency department through one of four paths. They can either be brought in by ambulance, they can be brought in with the police, they can be brought in by family or friends, and typically that is as a walk-in, but that can be done through an ambulance as well. Or they can come in on self-referral, and again, that's typically a walk-in. One of the issues with this, though, is that the ambulance police and sometimes the family and friends um, bringing them in, they're often under duress in that they've been um, scheduled under the Mental Health Act and are not coming in willingly. So partly because of this, but partly because of the nature of acute mental health conditions, as they may have additional needs to those who come in with a physical injury or illness. Um, they often have this loss of agency because they've been brought in under duress. Um, they're often very anxious, partly because of their mental health condition, but also because of just the whole thing of being coming brought into an emergency department when you don't want to be there. Um, they may have reduced cognition or awareness. They often have reduced self-control. Uh, many of them come in intoxicated with either drugs or alcohol. And a lot of them also have trauma from past unsatisfactory encounters with the ambulance or police or staff, particularly security staff within an emergency department. So this mismatch between the needs of these uh, patients and the emergency department processes can lead to additional stress and it can lead to early escalation of behaviour on the part of the patient and subsequently poor outcomes for those who, who come in with a mental health condition. So um, we wanted to try and fix this problem or, or we'd like to try and help fix the problem. And the first thing we need to know to do that, of course, is to understand more about the problem. So th this part uh, of our study to do with the journey of mental health patients is part of a larger study that we've been doing in emergency departments for a couple of years now. Um, the aim of the studies overall is to understand how work is done in an emergency department system. And we want to change our understanding from the traditional understanding of an emergency department as a, uh, a production line where people come in one end and there's a flow through the department, through the various places, and then they come out the other end. Um, the, it's like the top diagram on the right, a very, very linear process, very, very time controlled, and really doesn't take into account the needs of the patients. Um, what we really want to do is understand an emergency department more along the lines of the bottom diagram, which is a causal loop diagram of the relationships between an emergency department and the influence of various aspects of processes in the emergency department on each other. So why do we want to understand it? Well, understanding how the ED actually works, as opposed to how we think it works, means that we can start to design improvements for that system and interventions that actually work. So during this study, our data collection consisted of a document review uh, where we looked at documents uh, right from state government documents uh, through to hospital documents, documents within the emergency department itself um, that governed both the administrative processes of the emergency department, but also the, uh, the guideline treatment protocols within the emergency department. Uh, we conducted interviews with uh, people who worked in that emergency department, uh, doctors and nurses and some of the other staff. And we also did over 260 hours of observations where we shadowed different people, staff who worked in an emergency department as they went about their daily work. Uh, so we looked at doctors, nurses, uh, leaders within the department, administrative people, porters uh, or people who move patients around and the security personnel. And we shadowed them for their whole shift. So if it was a 12 and a half hour shift, we were there, whether that was 12 and a half hours during the day or 12 and a half hours overnight. So from that work, uh, we developed a FRAM of the patient journey into and through the ED from a mental health patient perspective. 
So we used the collected data that we collected as part of the big project. And there were really two steps to building this particular frame. The initial model was uh, a workers imagine model based on the policies and guidelines uh, on the handover process from New South Wales Health. And the second part uh, in, or second step in building the model was where we modified it based on what we actually saw. So what we observed, what we learned through interviews and, uh, and talking just general conversation with the emergency department clinicians. So as close as we could get uh, to a workers done type model. So I'm going to show you the model now and I'm going to start with the handover for the physical type illness or injury. And as you can see, um, and, and this is quite a high level view of the processes through the emergency department. But as you can see, they are, the patients come into the emergency department uh, either via ambulance or they enter what we call self-referral, which is where they walk into the emergency department. And when they enter their triage, so a nurse, um, their, their, um, the administrator signs them in and then they're triaged by a nurse um, who decides uh, how urgent their condition is and allocates them to treatment. Uh, then they are seen by a doctor uh, where medical treatment is provided. And sometimes they have comorbidities in addition to the thing they present with that means that will control how that treatment is carried out. And then once their medical condition is assessed and their treatment's provided, um, then they stay until they're well. Uh, either they might be discharged back to the community or they might be admitted to the hospital. So that's the patient journey for a patient who has a physical injury or illness. So what about a patient that comes in with an acute mental health ep episode? This is what their frame looks like. So as you can see, uh, someone coming in with a mental health condition might also have a physical injury. Um, often, particularly if they've um, intoxicated with drugs or alcohol, they can have injured themselves as well. So they might have physical issues as well as mental health issues. So um, I've left the green up there showing the physical aspect of the treatment, but the mental health patient would have both a physical and uh, an integrated physical and mental health aspect of their treatment. So both the green and the red. So the first thing you can see is, is it is a very busy process um, for, the, for those patients that come in with a mental health condition. So again, they can come in through the four ways of entry. They can come in through the ambulance. They can come in with police. Uh, they can come in with family and friends or they can self-refer where they walk in. So. If they come in via ambulance, there's additional forms to complete. Um, because they've come in not of their own volition, there's, there's a form to complete um, to sign them in. So that form has to be done before they can be triaged. Uh, if they come in with the police, uh, again, um, the police have to complete a form and it's a different form to the one the ambulance have to complete. But again, it's to do with them coming in uh, where it's not of their own volition, so not of their own consent. So that form also has to be completed uh, before the patient can be triaged. Uh, so, so already um, time has been taken in completing paperwork before they can even be seen. Now, uh, when they're triaged, uh, there's two aspects to their triage because they have to be looked at, um, they have to be triaged to a mental health assessment, but they also have to be triaged to a medical assessment in case there's a medical component that is either overlaying the mental health component or sometimes causing the mental health component. So for example, someone could come in with a urinary tract infection, uh, which looks may look like a cognitive or mental health issue, but it actually is an underlying medical issue. So they need to see both, uh, both types of doctors. So they'll come in and a mental health assessment is performed and, um, and a provisional uh, mental health diagnosis is made. And then from there, um, they go and additional treatment is provided. So where we are here in this, uh, this left-hand hexagon towards the bottom of the fram, this says provide immediate treatment. And this is the case. So mental health patients are triaged um, in categories similar to the physical health categories, but the, the reason for that category is quite different. But in short, I won't go through all the different triage categories. There's five of them. In short, any time that, um, that the patient is exhibiting any sort of agitational restlessness, restlessness that can end up as either physical or verbal um, agitation or abuse, 
Um, there are category one or two, which means that they need to be seen within 10 minutes. So they need to get to this immediate treatment option within 10 minutes of arriving at the ED. So you can see already all these steps on the left-hand side of the FRAM have to, be, have to be performed within 10 minutes of arrival for many of these patients. So, so patients who are already anxious are now being rushed through, you know, to try and get these steps done so that they can, they can receive this immediate care. So from that point, um, they have ongoing care and management in the ED, um, but then they can't always be discharged to the community. Um, often they have to go to a mental health facility and they need to be escorted to that mental health facility. So there's additional steps in arranging the transfer of their care and in arranging for them to be escorted um, to the inpatient facility. So as you can see, many, many more steps, and I haven't gone through all the different um, preconditions and resources involved in, uh, in this, but that there are many more than there are for, um, for the patients that come in with a physical condition. So even something um, like the treatment, when they provide the immediate treatment, um, they have to provide a statement of rights because the person is receiving treatment often against their will. So many additional things to the, to the physical process. So just looking at, um, at some of the individual functions, this will give you an illustration of the difference in complexity. So this is just the triage the patient function. And as you can see on the top left-hand side, uh, this is the triage for a patient with a physical condition. And as you can see, looking at the different aspects of the FRAM, there's some inputs and there's some outputs, and there's a couple of resources, but really there's not that many connectors for that particular, for triaging a patient with an illness or an injury. But if we look at this right-hand diagram, triaging the patient with a mental health condition, um, the number of connections and, and uh, the number of resources required and the number of controls over that process are much greater. So if you have a look at just the list here, and we haven't even included all of them, we've just included the most, the key ones. So as you can see, a much longer and more acute uh, list of things that have to be done just for the triage component. Um, if we look at the uh, this one of the others, this one's performing the uh, the health assessment, so or the medical assessment. On the top left again, we've got um, performing an assessment for physical illness or injury. And as you can see, even with a patient with comorbidities, where there's certain controls over that part that has to be performed, there's still not very many steps or resources required. Um, the only real resource in terms of personnel is the doctor who actually does the medical assessment. Um, so it's really quite a, uh, I mean, an emergency department would say that this is a resource intensive um, component of care. But if you compare it to the mental health patient, it, it's, it's quite low resource in comparison. So the one on the right here is the performed mental health assessment. Uh, for the mental health patient and have a look at all these resources required and controls that cover it. So um, as you can see, and in this case, we haven't actually plotted all the controls in because it would just make the FRAM incredibly complex, but we've, we've listed them. So you can see all those red things are resources and controls that are required. So um, yeah, so just looking at it, you can see that it's much, much more complex. So, so just in, in summary for the ambulance ED handover for the mental health, health patients, there, there are many more steps in the patient journey. Uh, there are many more controls. There are many more administrative processes and there are many more resources needed. And yet there's often less time to do them because of that issue to provide the initial treatment within usually 10 minutes. Um, there's less time to do them. And it's often, as I said, with an uncooperative patient. Um, rather than trying to, um, if we're going to fix this, rather than trying to work with the normal ED processes and just adding more complexity to fix it up, in situations that are time critical like this, we probably need to rethink the process. So we know in a complex system, for example, that, it, that it's best to simplify the system. We know that if we provide goals, it works much better than dictating processes that need to be followed. We know that if we can create slack, it can reduce the need for escalation. And for a mental health patient, escalation often means chemical and physical uh, restraints end up being applied, which is even more stressful. Um, so also we know and in complex systems, if we're going to fix it, 
Um, we need to take advice from those who do the work. So the doctors and nurses and the security people and the ambulance people and police who are involved with the mental health patient journey. And even more importantly, we have to take advice from the mental health patients themselves on what they need. So the next steps for us are to validate this model uh, doing further work with the ED staff. Um, we were meant to have done this by now, but it's been delayed about two years with COVID. Um, and then the next uh, step is to develop and trial um, new modified processes for the mental health patients in the ED in collaboration with the ED stakeholders. So the ambulance, police, ED staff and so on, and especially with the mental health patients themselves. So thank you um, and we're open for discussion.